Um, so um, thanks for coming. Um, so my name is Valerie Horsley, as she mentioned. I'm a professor in molecular cell and developmental biology here. Um, I have been here seven years, so I have a research lab. I teach undergraduates. Um, and I came from Rockefeller University. I did my postdoc with Elaine Fuchs. Um, and before that, I was at Emory as a PhD student. I got my PhD in like cell and developmental biology. Before that, I was at a very small liberal arts school called Furman University. And if you're not from the South, you probably have never heard of it. Um, it has 2,500 students and hardly any research at the time. They've definitely improved that since then. Um, so that's kind of my trajectory for getting here. Um, and so what I wanted to do today was to sort of share um, my perspective on how the academic job search works um, and then how you can um, develop skills to talk to your PI and also to get to this point where you would be looking for an academic job. And feel free to inter interrupt me anytime during the talk. Can I just get a sense of who you guys are? How many of you guys are postdocs? Okay, and graduate students? Okay, that's what I figured, but thanks, okay. Um, okay, so when I was putting this together, I was doing it from my perspective, which, um, you know, I, we work at Yale University, which is a tier one research university, um, and that's sort of where I've done my training um, as, a, as a scientist. But there are several other types of research academic jobs that you can get. Um, so there's lower tier universities that have less research intensive um, places. They might have more teaching. An example of that would be Wesleyan University, which you guys might be familiar with. Um, and then there's primarily undergraduate universities that have much more teaching um, required and less uh, research. So an example of this would be Quinnipiac. Um, and what I'm going to give you a perspective on is what I know, which is a tier one university setting. Um, I'll kind of mention through the talk where you might change your CV um, and your perspective and what they're looking for um, at these other types of, of universities. Okay, and so I thought I would just give you a start with a timeline of what the, the um, search kind of entails and kind of going through the timeline, what I would recommend for each step. So the first thing is that the applications are due. Um, that's happening probably now. Their are new searches are being um, announced. I'll tell you where that happens um, from September to December usually are the deadlines. Sometimes it's rolling. Um, sometimes it's earlier than this or later in the spring, but in general, most searches will have deadlines um, in the fall before December. Um, and so then, so what do you do for an application? Where do you find these jobs that are being advertised? Um, generally, you can look two places for most jobs. So um, nature and science both have career websites, which I've listed here. Um, so you can go on these sites, and I've just kind of, I did a screenshot of nature jobs this, today. Um, and so you can see here are the jobs of the week and different faculty positions. And you can search, you can set up a search, so it'll send you jobs that are of, of interest in your, um, in your field. Um, and so you can kind of get a, an idea of what jobs are out there being advertised. Do you need to have an ad to apply for a job? No. So if there's a place that you really want to go, for instance, for me, my family is from northern Alabama. I thought Vanderbilt was my dream job. I sent my CV to the department head of the department I thought I would fit best. And I said, you know, I'm going on the job market. If you know of any opportunities at Vanderbilt, please let me know. And in that way, I got interviews there and at Michigan, where my husband's from. So it, you can just kind of cold call places and send your CV directly to the departments that you're interested in. Okay, but let's say you find an ad that seems like it's a place you would want to go. Here's an example of one. Here's Skirball um, in New York City. So this is what the ads sort of look like. They explain what the place is like, what they're looking for, and you can see interactive and creative candidates, which I'm sure you all are. We all are interactive and creative. And um, they're looking for someone in metabolic signaling and cellular dynamics. So this sounds kind of vague, but, more, but also very specific. So if you don't work in this field of met metabolics and dynamics, um, should you apply for this job? Yes, you should. 
if this department or whatever, where, where the search is coming from looks like your research could fit, even if it's not in this specific area, you should still apply. Um, they might be looking for this area, but it's still good to, to just send your application. Um, and so then they'll describe what the, uni what the university is like um, and where your appointments would be held. Um, and these appointments are generally just where your promotions go through, who you would primarily be meeting with in faculty meetings, and who you would be interacting with, probably where your space would be in the building with that department. Okay, so where is it? What are they looking for? So you, I said you should apply even if it's not in the, in the specific area. And so what do they want for the application? In general, it's pretty um, much the same, but there will be some differences at different universities. So you'll need to write a cover letter, you need a CV, your research statement, and in general, they're from three to five pages. Um, you need, they, it looks like they want one recent publication. Most places probably wouldn't do that. And you need three letters of reference. Some places might want more, but in general, three is pretty standard. And this one is due November 30th, 2015. Okay. Um, and so I want to go through kind of what the aspects of the, what I recommend for the aspects of the application. Okay, so the cover letter, um, so you want to describe who you are, why you're the best candidate they could ever hire, seriously, and um, how your research is a perfect fit for their department. So you want to kind of look through their website and see certain people that you, you think you could synergize with. So they want to bring someone that's going to bring a fresh view of science to their department, but also someone that they're going to like inc improve their science with, right? So if you can say, I could collaborate with so-and-so because our research works together, this is a good way to kind of pull your application to the top of the pile. Um, so in your CV, what are people looking for? They really want to see your publications. That's the most important thing. The more first author or the better first author publications you have, the better. As you guys probably all know, that's what you're working towards. Um, but really, that's the most important part of your CV. For your research statement, um, really, people want to see clarity, big picture, this is where they're going to see whether your research really would synergize with the department's kind of overall view or what they want to go into. Um, and you, would, you probably should include a few figures, images from your data, models, et cetera. So you can think of this as sort of laying out the big picture as well as sort of what, kind of ex what your program would look like initially in the first five years. And then your letters of recommendation. Besides your publications, the next and most important thing for your application are the letters of recommendation. So really, so we're all human beings and really networking is, this is where networking matters the most in science. So the names of the people that you have writing letters for you are very important. So you should try to meet the most famous person in your field and see if they will write you a letter. Seriously. If you don't already work for that person, then you should find them and try to get them to write you a letter. Because the people that are on the search committee are going to be impressed if so-and-so that they know wrote a letter for you. That's just the way it works. That's humanity in this process. If, does it mean that if you don't get this to happen, you're not going to get a job? No. But these are all just tips to help you kind of lift your application to the top of the pile. So in my department, we generally do what we call open searches. So we're looking for anything, the best biology in the world, right? So we get 400 applications every search. If we do a more specific search, we'll get 100 applications. And then we'll invite 5 to 11 people. So, so these tips are all to bring you into that 5 to 11 people so that you get the interview. Any questions on that so far? Question? How specific would these letters of giving people be? Like, yeah. Um, so the question is, how specific would these letters be? Um, so 
they will be able to talk about how your work is important. So they're not going to say, like, I know this person so well or whatever. They're going to say, I met this person at a meeting. Their PI or they gave a presentation, and I was very impressed by their work. Them saying that it's important for the field is what is going to get you the interview. And you need to have your advisor write a letter as well. So, you know, that's going to be one of them. But just thinking about who else can write you letters, trying to network at meetings, is real. this is where it's very important. Okay. Um, any other questions on this part so far? Okay. Okay, so you compile all this information. Where does it go? So ev in general, this is a standard way this works. There's a search committee that is made up of the members of the department or the institute that is running the search. And so these members will go through the 300 applications and they will pull out 40 or 50. And then they'll go through those and they'll decide who are the top five or 11 that we want to bring for an interview. Okay. So often it's the, what they, these people actually work on what are they excited about that's going to pull your application to the top? It's going to be who they know that wrote letters for you, this type of thing. So there's a lot of humanity and sort of not necessarily negative bias, but bias in terms of what people are excited about that sways who people get interviewed, what people get interviewed. So that's why you should send lots of applications because you never know who's excited about your work. So the more applications you send, the better, probably. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about once we talk about interviews, if you send a million and everyone wants you to interview, what you do about that. But that's probably not what you're worried about. OK, so, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so what else about the search committee? Um, I think that's, that's a good overview of the search committee. So you will not know, so the question is, is the inform, do you know the information about who's on the search committee? No, you will not know. So it's definitely discussed, right? You will not know who the, you will know who the chair of the department is, um, but you will not necessarily know who the chair of the committee is. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the chair of the department will be on the, their website, um, but the chair of the department is probably not the chair of the search committee or on the search committee because he or she has so many things to do that this is one of the things that they delegate to other people. Yeah. Okay, and so the search committee in our department will bring, you know, the, decide who these 11 people are, and then we have interviews. Um, so the standard way, I'll talk about the standard interview, um, but in general, we'll call applicants, so after the due date, so that's why there's due dates. So that November 30th, probably in December, that department is going to meet to decide who is going to be invited, and they'll start calling people to invite them in January. Some people will invite as early as November, but in general, it's like after, after the new year. So they'll call and invite people for interviews and, um, and schedule the interviews from November to April. In general, the way it's, it works is that each um, person comes each week, so there's one person per, per week, and I'll talk about kind of how that works. So this is sort of what your day would look like on an interview. Um, so you'll come in in the morning, you'll meet someone for breakfast, and you'll have meetings all morning, and this is if your talk is in the morning or midday. You'll have your talk, you'll have a chalk talk, you'll have more meetings, and then you'll have dinner, and sometimes you'll have meetings the next day. Um, this is a very tiring process. I don't recommend that you schedule more than one a week. It took me about a week to recover from each visit per day. In some places it was two days, so I needed two weeks. Um, okay, and so what, so the most important parts of this are the, the talk and the chalk talk. So the talk is going to give this group of people that has decided that you're someone that they might want to have as a colleague. Um, that, so they get to look at your science, how you explain your science, um, whether they think you're 
sm actually smart. You'll am be amazed at how many people come in and interview where we're like, what? How do they have these amazing papers? Um, so they want to see that if you're a good speaker, they want to see if you explain things well to a broad audience. More and more these days, science is about marketing your work. So if you can't explain your things well, your science well in a, t in a talk for an interview, it's not a good sign. They want to be able to look at your data and be convinced by it. And these are going to be general people, so they're not going to, you, you might have an expert or two in the, in the audience, but in general, these are going to be people that aren't really used to thinking about your work, unless it's a very specific department for your, um, your research. And at the end of the talk, usually the talks are about 45 minutes. And at the end of the talk, you should spend about five to 10 minutes just kind of giving an overview of your future plans. Um, you'll go more into detail in your future plans in the chalk talk, um, but this is just like a standard seminar you would see at any kind of seminar series. Um, so you should you know, kind of model it after people that come give great talks at your departmental seminar. The other thing I would recommend is go see talks for job searches. So there will be many job searches starting um, at, at Yale, and you should go see the talks and see how people do, and then you can see who actually gets chosen. So you can see what kind of, how did, what did their talk give that made it exciting for the department. Any questions about the talk? Um, yeah, so you should practice your talk. It should be like a TED talk or really good, really good. If it's bad, you're not going to get the job. That should seem obvious, but really it's amazing how many people come and give bad talks. And um, I recommend this to every talk I give on speaking. Use your body and your voice to give a good talk. So you want to project well. You want to seem confident. If you have an annoying voice, you should ask your coworkers, is my voice annoying? <laughs> Some people have really annoying voices. It's not good. You should go to a voice coach. Like it's really, this is really important that you give a good talk. It's the most important thing if you give an interview. Okay. Do you always know who will be on the first interview? You will, you will never know. Oh, so you just want to like a... It's a secret. You'll never know. So you might have a host. Um, the host is probably on the search committee. The people you meet with might or might not be majority search committee. Um, but in the end, sort of everyone has a voice about who's hired. Right. So I mean, it doesn't really matter. You need to make a good impression oh. to everyone. Yeah. OK. So the chalk talk. How many of you guys have ever given a chalk talk? So the first time I gave a chalk talk, I had no idea. I'd never given a chalk talk. I was like, what am I? I have no idea how to do this. Um, so I'm going to give you a little mini chalk talk so you can see like what one looks like. And this was sort of what was recommended to me um, to, to do, and I think it works really well. OK, so for the chalk talk, you see I've already divided the board into three, um, three regions. So in the, in the first region, I'm going to just say, so depending on when your chalk talk is in relation to your original talk, sometimes it's in a different visit. Sometimes it's the next day. So you, you need to try to figure out, like, do these people really know what I do? Do I need to remind them? So you could just summarize in one part sort of these are the two main things that I'm really excited about. Okay. So when I did my job talk, I worked on two different projects. One was related to sebaceous gland development, so I talked about that. Um, and the other was about stem cell activity in the, in the hair follicle. Okay, so I, I'm reminding people, you guys, what I told you already. Um, and so in the future, what I really want to work on are these two main areas. And um, the first area that I'll describe 
I can envision being a perfect application for an R01. So if you're, look, if you're looking in the United States, they want to see that your research is fundable. Okay, so they're going to say, so I'm going to say, so I'm really excited about this stem cell activity and I showed you some images of this transcription factor where you could see this expression of this transcription factor in the bulge and we know, you guys will know what the bulge is because I've told you, so, and we know that upstream of this is calcium signaling. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of blah, blah, blah. So then, so my aim for my R01 would be, and you write it out, and the next aim for my R01 would be blah. And these are all to test the hypothesis that, okay? You want to be engaging and writing and interacting, okay? And so then, so you tell them about, like, this is a, my main research that I'm going to get started right away. And this is what I want to do for long term. This is where I see my research going in 10 years. This is really what I want to study. And so you can say, so I was excited about trying to do stuff in other epithelial tissues besides the skin. So I said, I'm really excited about thinking about what other epithelial tissues, how they are regulated. And I think we can use our system that we have in the skin to really apply that to other tissues and really learn a lot about stem cells and other tissues. Okay, so I've given them a background to remind them about what I'm excited about. I've given them an immediate project that I think could be fundable by an agency. And then I give them a big picture for where I wanna go. So it shows that you can get funding and that you can think broader beyond what you actually are doing currently in your current lab, okay? Some people give handouts. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Um, I think the most important thing is to practice this because most of us don't talk, speak like this and get a lot of practice doing this. So just practice with your team, with your friends, you know, try to just get this to be nailed because a lot of people even if they give a good talk if the chalk talk is not impressive that's another place that some questions that people ask at chalk talks are a oh, question up here yeah, um, typically how long should your chalk talk be chalk talks are usually an hour um, so you could it, but it'll be a lot of questions so you know you should aim for 40 minutes maybe um, I just gave a little speeded up version here, but yeah. But also, they most likely tell you in advance that they're going to want to do a chalk talk and you're listening to the talk? Most, the question is, will most places um, tell you if you're going to have a chalk talk? That's a, I'm glad you brought up that point. So yes, most places will tell you. Um, this is the standard chalk talk. Some places I went, they were like, oh, you actually want to use chalk? Yes. So we had to like raise the board. There was this tiny little board. Um, so you might want to, you should ask, what is the chalk talk like? What do you expect from the chalk talk? One place I went, it was me sitting at a table while they berated me and tried to like quiz me like it was my qualifying exam. <laughs> that was not my favorite place. Um, so it's all different. Um, but I think what I found really um, great about the chalk talks is it really gives you a sense of how the your future co potential colleagues, how they think, how they interact. And it's really a fun opportunity for you to like get great ideas about what you're going to do. Um, so it's, it's actually really, it's a good, it's a good thing. Okay, another question up here. Um, if you're coming to change gears from what you did at three or four stock to what you will do when you have your own lab, right. how would you scale that? Um, so I think that um, so I, I think you could say this is what I've done, um, but this is what I really want to do. I think you, you need to sell that you're going to be able to get funding to do that because that's a hard thing. So why are your, your skill sets really going to apply to that? Do you have collaborators that are going to help you? If you do, that's a good thing. Um, but I think there must be a reason why you're switching. You could say, 
well, you know, this is the main research drive in my, of my current lab. And so I know that in order for me to be a successful in running an independent lab, I need to, you know, divert my attention somewhere else. And so this is what I'm excited about. Mm. Uh, should I have, is there room for collaboration letters? So the question is, should you include collaboration letters with your application? I don't think so. I mean, unless you want them to speak to you as your recommendation letter, um, I think they will trust that you have done this. If you have thought to get collaborators, they will think that's a great thing. Um, yeah, another question. Is the audience smaller? Yes. So usually it's only the faculty, and usually it's closed door. So you know, everyone else will leave, and the, only the faculty will stay for the chalk talk. Other questions? Do you also know the kind of like a proposed initiative for people that exist with the department? I don't think so. The question is, do you need to? show examples of how this will synergize with the department? You could. I've never seen anyone do that, actually. Okay. I think if they've already invite you, invited you, they're already excited about what you're thinking about anyways. So I think they just want to see that you're going to be able to build an independent research program, that you have ideas, and that you can get funded. Well, you should be reasonable. Okay. One R1 is probably enough in the you know, first five years. Um, I think they, so how do you be confident without being arrogant? I, yeah. yeah. Because like, I would assume right. people who attend the Chalk Talks will be also having difficulty getting grants, and then they could be pissed off that the outside company <laughs> has it easier. Yeah. Or they should have done. Yeah, so they're not going to, so in general, Having a search for a department is exciting. We want new people. Um, it's an opportunity for the department to grow, get new, fresh ideas, ha interact with other people. So people aren't generally like cranky with them, except the one place I went that was kind of cranky in general. Um, not here, obviously. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, you just, you want to sell yourself in, in that you're the expert in what you're talking about. Right? And that you've thought about the things that are important. Right? So by bringing up that I think this is a fundable application at the NIH, you know, some people, in, in my department, we, we have plant biologists, we have, you know, people that do very broad things that might not, so we often ask, like, how do you think this research will be fundable? Right? So you have to say, well, I think it's fundable because it addresses a biomedical research problem, right? Or it's important for, you know, you just want to understand what, what we want you had to have thought about what you need to do to get funding. Okay. Other questions about the Chalk Talk? Okay. Okay, so in the meetings that surround these talks, um, so you'll meet with individuals in the department, in their office usually. Um, so you want to be engaged. You want to be polite. Um, these seem obvious, but sometimes that's not happening. But this is also the opportunity for you to ask questions about the university, about the department, about their research, so they'll probably tell you about their research. You should ask questions about their research, seem interested in their research. Um, you can ask them about the tenure process, so how, what, what's the percentage of people that get tenure here? I mean, this, is, this interview is as much about them trying to recruit you as you trying to decide whether you would ever want to go there. So you should try to find out information that, about things that are important to you. What do you do after work? 
if that's important to you, that you can have something to do after work, um, you should ask people that. You know, you're having a conversation with them. You could ask them about recruitment of students and postdocs, like how easy, how, is the how are the students, how many students do you have, you know, what's the pool of students to faculty ratio, what's the quality of postdocs you can recruit here, that sort of thing. If you need specific equipment for your research, you should ask if, you know, do you do flow cytometry? I would ask this, where, you know, this type of thing. So these are the kind of questions you should, you know, you can ask them. Okay, and so then dinner is still, you're still getting interviewed during the dinner. I even had to give like a mini chalk talk at the dinner after talking to 25 people. It was terrible. I was so tired. I was like, can we just talk about the weather? Um, but you're still, so you're going to be tired at the dinner because you've been on all day. You've given two talks. You're, it's, you're tired. But you need to try to like stay engaged, be someone that they would want to work with, right? So yeah, so you want to keep continuing to engage in conversation. Okay, so this is the standard type of interview. Um, so my department is actually gonna run a totally different style this year, which is very popular in Europe, um, which is more of a symposium style interview. And so we're gonna invite, we're gonna have three searches where we invite five people to come speak at the same day, and they'll all see each other interviewing, and then we'll all you know, interview them at the same day. So this is very efficient. For running three searches, it's kind of crazy. Um, so this is, but there's other places in the US that are doing this. This is very popular in Europe. So this is just another style of, of interviewing. So you would still have meetings, but you'll sit like in a symposium where you get to see the talks of all the other candidates. And then in our department, we're still gonna have a chalk talk where we kind of pull people out. I don't know how that's gonna work. Uh, we're gonna have meetings and then all of them are gonna go to six different dinners and interact with different faculty. Um, so this is another style um, and just be aware that it might be like that if you get invited. Okay, so after you leave, you should email and say thank you to the host, maybe the department chairperson, um, any other faculty that you thought you know, you connected with or your research could synergize with. I mean, this is a great opportunity for you to connect and network for future collaborations. So even if you decide you're not gonna go to this place, you might collaborate with them in the future. So, you know, it's always good to kind of keep the connection and appreciate that they spent time with you. Okay, so that's the interview process. So you interviewed and then you wait. It's like a very dark, sad time. You're waiting. Does anyone like me? Does anyone want me to be their colleague? So you're waiting. And then hopefully someone will call you and say, we decided you're our top candidate and we would like to make you an offer. Okay, so then from April to July or even later, universities are slow. This process always takes forever. Um, but hopefully you'll get an offer. So you get a job offer probably the chairperson will email you and say, so I need a list of everything you need. So you have to prepare an Excel file with all the equipment, everything that you need, and the price of all of it. And you want it to um, total at least a million dollars, if not more. So, you know, just add things. No. So they will say, send me a list of what you need. But that's like a verbal offer, whether you can. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically the way it works is they have to come up with like, how much do you need, right? If you send them, oh, I only need $500,000, then the offer letter that they type up will say, well, we're going to need $500,000. So the negotiation starts as soon as you send your material and supply list. Question? Yeah. So the question is, should you, should you research the people that you're going to meet with? I think it's a waste of time. 
I, I think that you guys are all smart. You could probably ask a question on the fly. If not, you should practice that immediately. At every seminar you attend, you should ask a question. That's the way you're going to build those skills to be able to, for someone to explain their research and just ask a question, right? So I think, I mean, you could if you have time, but I never have time for this. So I just, you know, I try to act very engaged. I ask a question, talk to them about how's it like living here, this type of thing. They're not going to know if you're engaged and ask a question that you didn't read up on, on them. Question in the back. So the, the question is, in your setup package, do you include salaries, including yours or students and postdocs? Yes. So the million dollars should include your salary as well as the salaries of the people. Sometimes you'll get an offer that it doesn't include that. So offers are varied. Sometimes you have to cover your salary. Sometimes you don't. It just totally depends on the institution and the department. But that's all stuff you'll figure out as you start negotiating. But in general, the standard package for top one, this is again for top tier one research institutes, is a uh, million dollars or more. Question? Could you back up a little bit? Yeah. For the funding and uh, application? Yeah. So it depends. So the question is, for the recommendation letters, how, how are they sent? Do you send them, or are they sent by the individuals? It depends on the, in, the university. So every application will probably be different. Um, sometimes they'll just ask for a list of names and not ask for the letters until later. Sometimes you'll have the individuals. Usually it's the individuals sending them. Sometimes they'll want them to all come together in the same package. But that's really unusual because most things are electronic now. So usually you just send them a link to the place where you send that, the letter. So it's good to contact people in advance. Yeah, you, you need to set that up in advance. Yeah, where you write a letter. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Question back here. So back to the startup package. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So how long is the startup package good for? In general, it's the first three years of your lab. So you should, they, they expect that by the third year, you would have gotten an R1 or some other research funding. Yeah. Question? Uh, I have a question going back to the intro to the talk. Uh -huh. Correct. So uh, I, I was wondering how much, how much do you think that part of the students should talk about science and like So the question is, how much of your interaction with people matters in terms of the interview? Um, so I think that if people sense that you're a jerk, you're not going to get the job. If people sense that you're quiet, but they think your research is amazing, you might get an, an interview. I mean, a, the job offer. So I think, you know, I think it depends on what your personality is giving them. Um, so the, so the, the thing that actually talking the part from the beginning, like interacting with people who would be personal personality. Uh, I think they, they don't want someone that doesn't have any personality, that can't like hold a conversation, right? But it's mostly, like, they're going to ask you questions. They're going to engage you. They, they're used to doing this. So they're going to get you talking. Um, and they're, they just want to see that you're not a jerk, basically, and that you can hold a conversation that isn't all, always about, and, you know, once you're prepared. What if they ask those probing questions, i.e., you have to reply? What, what if they? What about the song? Do you have, like, uh -huh. Okay, so what if they ask proving questions? So it's illegal for anyone to ask about your spouse or your family situation. Okay. So no one should ask that, but people will. 
Um, so you can decide whether you want to answer it or not. I personally think that the more they know about you, the better. So you might as well just lay it all out there, is my personal feeling. Um, but I think it's up to you. You know, um, I think it's, I always ask people, so who are we competing with? Um, because I think it's good to know. Like, and I can say, well, this place is better because of X, Y, Z. Um, but you could say, you know, well, other, you, know, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But, you know, it's not, it's not like unimpressive if people don't have other interviews because this whole process is a little stochastic, right? It's like who is there in those chairs? You know, it's not, it doesn't mean anything to only have two interviews. I don't, I don't think so, as long as you're not seeming like you're being a jerk again. Okay. <laughs> don't want to be a jerk. That's the thing. <laughs> so they are different with the food dollar to find the position in the same interview. So are there any differences if the postdoc wants to find a place, a, a position in the same institute? So it depends. Um, often you might have to go through this process. But sometimes if you just, again, I said in the beginning, you can just send your application anywhere anyways, and they will maybe find a position if they're interested in hiring you. So if you do it that way, they will probably bring you, they'll do the same interview process, and everything else should be the same. Do you have any advantages? So it's actually, so if you stay at the same institution, it's actually a disadvantage for getting funding um, not that you can't do it, but you, it, people will say, well, how do you differentiate yourself from your, the person that you've been working for? Um, everyone, the students will just go to that, you know, so I think it, it's better to leave, but there's many p examples of people that don't leave and it's, and they, they work it out. So you just need to get good at answering, how are you going to be different from your current boss and why did you stay where, where you're staying? Question. How important is your teaching experience there compared to your first position? And I'm asking because like, I, I don't have a PhD here in the US, but I still have a PhD uh, postdoc here. I don't have teaching experience, mm -hmm. so I don't know if you accidentally asked about it. So how important is teaching experience versus research? So the most important thing is research. Um, teaching is important if, so my department is, t we teach undergraduates. So we're always looking for people that look like they could teach. So in the talk, if they can give a good talk, then we want to hire them. We don't look to see how many classes you've taught or anything like that. Because our department's very interested in having a good research program, right? Um, at the, some of the other types of, of research institutes or the primarily undergraduate teaching institutions, they're gonna wanna see teaching that you've taught, that you, you know, have that experience. But if you want to do top one, tier one uh, research university, then teaching, it can help you because it teaches you how to speak in front of people, but it's not necessarily what they're going to look for. Is your paper is not uh, published yet? It's in the review process. Mm -hmm. Should you include that in your application or not? So if your paper is in progress but not published yet, should you include this in your application? This is a very good question. If you have no other papers, it's not going to be good for you in the, inter in the process. If you have other papers, so you think that they would look at your application without the other papers, um, you could put it in progress on your CV. You could say submitted to X under review X. Um, and if somehow it gets accepted in the period where the application process is open or you know, shortly after, you could send them an update and say, I just want you to know my paper got accepted and here's the letter from the editor saying it's accepted. So that's something you could do. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so other things that you should think about when you're negotiating for the job offer. Um, so your spousal situation. So. Yale did a study, 80% of junior faculty women have a spouse that's a scientist, 50% of males have a spouse that's a scientist, 
even if your spouse isn't a scientist, if you're going to move to a new city, you need to figure out what they're going to do if they ha want to have a career. Um, so this is something you should talk to them about, and you have to fight. Do not take a situation that's going to make your spouse unhappy. It's worth going, around, going another year and finding a situation that makes you both happy. Okay, and I can talk more about that if you guys have questions. Um, so you can t ask them about childcare if you have children. Are there tuition benefits for college or for private school if you're in New York City? There's some institutions that do that. Um, you should negotiate your salary. So the Chronicle for Higher Education has a list of all the general salaries for each institution. So you should look at that and figure out what people get paid and make sure that you don't get paid less. Um, so you can, you know, you should talk to them about where your lab's going to be. What's your, how much space are you going to get? What does it look like? Does it need to be renovated? All of these types of things. Um, your, how long your setup lasts. So some places you only have five years to spend your setup. Other places you have, you know, forever. So you want to know that, whether it's going to expire or not. Um, teaching require, yeah, question? Your uh, lab, the setup money, the startup money that they give your lab, yeah. Um, the teaching requirements and expectations, so you should know what's required of you of teaching. Do you get a year off of teaching when you're starting? Um, do you require any teaching? How many classes? What do you expect? That kind of thing. Um, every, even if you're in a primarily medical school appointment, you're going to have to teach a little bit for tenure. Um, so you might want to find out, like, how do people get involved in teaching, you know, just in general. Um, housing benefits, some places will give you money for a down payment. Not here. <laughs> moving expenses. Um, pretty much everywhere will pay your moving expenses. So you won't have to pay to move. That's a benefit. Yeah. How do you can't ask for a salary enough to last a year? Yeah, so how do you negotiate salary? So actually, I, I put this in here. So, um, so, other, so you must negotiate. It's very important to negotiate. And we know from many studies, so this is a book by these people, Linda Babcock and Sarah Lashaver, Women Don't Ask. It's a book, if you're a woman or if you're married to a woman or you know any women, tell them to read this book. Um, so basically, women don't ask. They don't negotiate. And it's very important that we do this because otherwise we're going to continue to be in this situation where we have, so this is just a plot, but basically they found that men are much more likely to negotiate. Um, and for men, negotiating is like playing a sporting game. This is a very general, right? Whereas for women, it's like going to the dentist. Um, so how do you do it? You should just say like, I, you know, I'm expecting $100,000 for my salary because I know that's the standard here based on my re research in the Chronicle for Higher Education. Use data, right? You could ask. Um, I wouldn't do that. Um, but you, you know that, I mean, it's, a, it's publicly available what people make. You can send the link and say, you know, I mean, so I, I got offered 125000 for a place in New York, Boston, Boston or New York. And I, when I was being recruited to Texas, I asked for 125000 Women don't ask, so I was like, I'm going to ask. Maybe they'll get me down to 100 but, you know, that's okay. Um, they were very offended. <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't go there, you know. So, you know, I mean, I think you learn a lot through this, like, about who you're dealing with and who your future colleagues might be. Um, but yeah, you should ask for more. How do you negotiate the, the chair? Yeah, usually it's the chair. Um, and so the way it works is so in the medical school here, the chair has the package, so you're negotiating directly with him or her. Um, here in, in, on main campus, the chair decides with you, kind of helps you put a package together, and then it goes to the provost's office, and they kind of decide how much you actually get. So it's, just, it's different processes, but, but you should always ask for more than they, than they give you. 
and see. They might say, no, we can't do that, and that's at least you asked. So that doesn't mean that they were, ver that they were very offended. Um, <laughs> so I think that they were not used, they were, they were offended. Maybe it was a little high. That's okay. Um, I just think they didn't, they didn't, it was very interesting because my husband's a scientist too, and he was getting recruited by this place. And they, they were treating him like a grown up, and they were treating me like a child. It was really ridiculous. And I think it was, you know, maybe they were offended that I was a woman asking for so much money. I don't know. But it wasn't a good sign. They didn't, did that jeopardize your ability to, and that was your only offer, would that have jeopardized you? I don't think so. At that point, they want you. They've already gone through the process of like starting this conversation. It would have been fine. Maybe they would have been a little annoyed with me when I started, but I would have charmed them away from that, right? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Question? So when you're negotiating about how can you benefit and all these things, is all of that also in your startup package list that you need to do? So, so the list in the Excel will be just like one file that you'll send. Um, the rest, you just say, I want to ask about these things. It can be in the same email. You can say, well, I've attached my list. You can see that it totals $1,500,000. And in addition, I want to ask about these different things. Yeah. So it's how many rounds of negotiation? Like how many rounds of negotiation okay. until you're ready to sign it? Okay. So you said it could be like. Oh, yeah. It's, not, it's, never, it's never final until you sign it. And this is the only time you have any power to get anything. Mm -hmm. So you should make sure that you have, you know, get what you need. A question in the back. So how do you negotiate your spouse situation? Let's say so, you have your spouse and you're facing the same situation. Right. So how did I negotiate it? So basically I told everyone at the very beginning that I have a spouse that needs a job. That's the situation, you know. Um, some pl most places said we can't help you, you know, c because again, this situation where it's like these random people, but if they really want you or your spouse, then they will make it happen. And if it doesn't work out, it's better, I, I said this before, it's better just to figure out some other situation. Um, and it's not always going to be perfect for both of you, right? Like you're not both going to be in ideal places for you, but if you both want tenure track jobs, you have to make it work and make it happen at the beginning. I've seen a lot of people take other positions and you never get back to the tenure track. Another question. And how do, you, how do the committees feel when they see the same situation, you know, two years in a row? How does a committee feel? Well, it might, so about the, an application the second year in a row. I don't, I don't think that it would matter a, they're probably not going to remember. If they didn't pick you the first time, they, you might be fresh. You have a new paper. Um, it's going to be different people, probably. So maybe you have a better chance with a different individual in the department. You know, I think you just got to send it. Just keep trying. This is one of the exceptions where your spouse is a genetic donor. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Is there anything that, in, yes, so can they help you even if your spouse is not in academia? Yes, they should connect you to whatever field your spouse is working in. So if your spouse is a lawyer, they should hook you up with lawyers. You know, you've got to make sure that you're going to be happy. They might not be able to find you a job necessarily, but they should at least like facilitate sort of your recruitment to this new city. Especially if it's a place like New Haven, where <laughs> there's not that much stuff. I mean, if you're going to New York, it's going to be easier, right? Or Boston, but. Question? So, well, so you have this back and forth of the negotiation. I guess this is like tier one, you know, easier, easy thing. Right. But what about you're applying for more teaching rounds, though? Like in yeah. colleges or? So, so the same is true for you know, lower tier universities, you're still going to get a setup package. The setup package might be less money. Um, you probably, you know, you won't ask for as, as many things. 
your research program will be smaller. Um, for under, primarily undergraduate teaching um, institutions, there the packages are very small. Um, you really only do research in the summer usually. Um, so it's, it's a very different negotiation and, and, and style of being recruited. Um, but you still have to ask for what you need, right? I mean, the same principles apply, I think. Is there any truth to the, your set, you need to make more than your setup package to the university for sure. Um, but that's like long term. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, you just need to get a grant funding, have a research program. They just want someone that's going to be successful, which means that you run an independent lab and you're ab able to self sustain it for the long term. I don't think anyone's like really looking for how much money you actually bring and whether you've like paid them back yet or something like that. I don't think they're doing that, but they just want to see that you're actually bringing in grant money. Okay, other questions? Okay, so do we have time? Let's see. Um, we have a few minutes. I'll, get, I'll take a couple of minutes just to highlight what I think about so it, most of you guys maybe have decided that you want to get do academia and that's why you're here. Um, but how do you talk to your PI or your boss about what your career goals are? Um, how many of you guys have talked to your boss about career goals? Okay, so most of you guys. Um, so I think it's important to have that conversation. First, you need to figure out what you want to do before you can have the conversation. It seems obvious, um, but I'll let you know in a secret, like no one really knows what they want to do. So if you're having doubts, like everyone has doubts, I don't know if this is what I want to do either, but here I am, you know. Um, I think you just try and try and see what you want to do. If you love doing research, you should try to get a research position. If you love teaching, you should find a position that, in, you know, combines both. Um, I think you should figure out what you love and try to figure out what your CV needs to be able to get the job that you want. Um, so how do you figure out what your CV needs to get the job that you want? You should just talk to people, like you came to this talk, that's a good sign. Um, so you want to ask people, well, I really want to do research at a tier one university, so what does my CV need to look like? Does it all need to be cell science nature papers? It depends, but not necessarily. You need to have good papers, um, but it's not necessarily all have to be at the top tier. Um, if you want to teach, you should teach and figure out if that's what you want to do. And you should feel comfortable talking to your PI. Some PIs don't want to hear like you want to do something different than what they are, what they are or what they're doing. Part of that might be they don't know how to help you. Just like I don't really know what it takes to get a job at a primarily undergraduate research, you know, institution. But you have to find people that can help you. So I know lots of people that work at places like that. So if someone in my lab comes to me and says, this is what I want to do, I'll put them in contact with those people. Um, so you find people that are doing the job that you want and you say, how do you, how did you get there? Um, I think you should talk about your career every year at minimum with your boss. If they don't bring it up, you should bring it up with them. Let's think of it, any other. Yeah, and I think, you know, you just have to have the conversation and talk to them about, you know, the transition to your own position. Um, presumably, it's going to somewhat contain research. Um, and if it does, then you've got to talk to them about how that's going to go. Sometimes that goes better than others. But if you don't have the conversation, it's not going to go well, probably. All right, so any questions about any situations you need help with? Yeah. Should your boss know that you're applying for jobs? Should your boss know that you're applying for jobs? <laughs> um, well, it depends on what job you want. Um, if you're going to another postdoc or another, you know, maybe not. Um, but if you want to apply for a research job, 
you probably want to have them write you a letter of recommendation. If you don't have them write a letter of recommendation, recommendation, you should have one of your other referees explain to the committee why you don't have your other person writing a letter. Because it's going to look weird that your PI is not writing a letter for you. Um, you could also address that in your cover letter if you needed to. But yes, you should communicate to your boss that you're planning to go on the job market. Sometimes they might not want you to because you haven't pumped out enough papers for them or whatever. Um, but I think, you know, it's not, your, it's not their life. So you can just say, well, I'm going to apply anyways. That's what I would do. But yeah. Yeah, so how do you make sure you can take something from the lab? Um, I think you should talk to other people that have left, if that's possible, um, because they'll kind of give you an indication on how it goes with your current boss. Um, I, I think for some people, you might know that you need to be careful about what you share with them. Not everyone's awesome. Um, so you don't want to give them ideas that they then do in, your, in the lab. Um, other people, you should talk to them and, you know, it'd be nice if people planned out, like, you can take this or whatever. I mean, I have to say that it's hard. It's hard to know where your science is going to go, right? So even if you say, I want this for my lab, and you go to your new position, there are lots of reasons why you might not ever get to that question. You might get it on a different tangent that... So there are many things that, in retrospect, I looked back and I said, I really would, should have, I would have said, I want that, right? But then I never ended up working on it. Because of other things came up, I had collaborations here, you know, so it's really, I think, I think it's, the best situation is to keep an open communication about what's happening. But that's not real, realistic in all situations. So I think you have to kind of figure out what's best for your situation and how much you kind of trust that your boss is really, like, wants you to be successful as an independent person. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and some labs have a reputation for not letting their people take their data. And so you might get, if, the, if your lab is one of those and it's well known that that's the case, you might get the question in the chalk talk, like, how are you going to, is your PI really going to let you take this? Um, so you could say yes, I don't know, or you could say we've had that conversation, you could say, no, um, we haven't had that conversation, but you know I have other ideas. I think if that's the case and it's well known that that's the reputation that your lab has, you probably want to think about something else that you're going to work on that's really unrelated. If you're a former prep lab, that wouldn't have any budget. Then yeah. So how do you figure that out? How do you figure out what's going to happen? I think you just have a conversation, and you're, you're going to be the guinea pig. There's two people in here that are going to be the guinea pig for me. Um, I think, yeah, it's just, you have to, tr you know, try and um, see what's going to happen. But I think if you, you, I mean, you know your PI pretty well. And... It totally depends. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I think, I mean, my goal for the people that leave my lab is that they're, like, able to be successful. So I want them to do that, right? Um, but that's not necessarily the goal for everyone. Sometimes they won't let you take things you made in the lab. So sometimes, I mean, you have to ask, can I take this? Um, so you need to know whether that's going to be possible. Um, sometimes, and, and, but I think it should be that you talk about you know, what do you think I should do? What, 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 these are the questions I'm interested in. What do you think about them? That's sort of like ideal. 
So sometimes you don't want to have that conversation. And just, it totally depends on this, you know, the people involved. Um, are there resources? Um, I guess your setup package, a transition award, so like the K99R00. Sorry, uh, Is that what you mean? No, I mean, I mean like it, it kind of is intimidating in some ways to come up with something sufficiently new and different from mm. what your previous mentors have taught you. And right. I just haven't seen much in the way of uh, help. Yeah, so ideally, so ideally, you wouldn't stray too far. Um, ideally, you would stay close, but really like doing the next thing. Um, because that's what's going to get funded. That's what, like, starting a lab is hard. I was so excited to run away from skin as soon as I could. And when I got there and I couldn't even grow cells, I was like, wow, there's no way I can get away from skin. I'm, I'm stuck with it for a while at least. So... Um, yeah, so I think, you know, you, you can't stray too far. So I think you just want to think of like, what is, you know, your, if your lab is working on the main thing, try to think of something else. But with the same tools. But the same tools and the same skills that you, you know, exactly. That's right. And you should ask other people, you know, talk to other colleagues, maybe not your PI, but other people, like, what do you think about this? These are my ideas. People are happy to talk about those kind of things with you. So you want to base it on your preliminary data, right? If you, we, we talked about this pr pr previously. If you want to go into a totally different avenue, you should find an expert in that avenue and have them be your collaborator. <coughs> and say, you know, so-and-so who's an expert in this is collaborating with me. But in terms of the interview, you really want to just convince them that you have good ideas and that you're going to be able to be independent from the research in, in, in the lab. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. How do you convince them? Like, how do you do the person hiring that person to go out to the local library to do that research and convince them, regardless of how much you want them to do? So, how do you divide the project? Yeah, like um, what do you do with everybody in the lab as they go about it? Yeah, so you work a little bit. So, I had a K99R00. I mean, I, I worked on the same project. It was supposed to develop tools to, to let me build my lab. Um, but when I started my lab, I worked on to something totally different. Oh, okay. I didn't even like do that project anymore. And they don't you care. Use the same grant. The, I use the same grant, yeah. The NIH doesn't actually really care what you do. They just want you to do things that are productive and make papers and, you know. So you don't, again, you don't want to stray too far, but you don't, so for instance, like I was talking about calcium imaging and all this stuff. I didn't do calcium imaging, right? But it was still related to this transcription factor, which I found was really important. So that's an example. Um, so you want to do something that's like, think big picture, like what could be really exciting for the field, but it's related to my work. Because that's what's going to be fundable at, you know, people will not fund me to go work on the mammary gland initially. Um, in the interview process, how do they view collaborations with other institutions? Do they see that as like a good thing that, you know, the first year I'm here, I'm going to bring in this person, I know from another institution to help train me and bring some of these people, or this institution Mm. So how are collaborations viewed? I think, I think there's no other way to do science anymore. 
So I think it's positive. It shows that you can work with other people, that you're doing things other people find are interesting. Um, it shows that you thought about that I'm not an expert in this and I need help. Um, I think it's going to be positive. There are, are old school people that think that collaborations are not good because they show that you can't actually do anything on your own. But I don't think that's the way science is done anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The neighboring institution that's doing some really great good. So you ask the so the community group that's doing it at their institution so they can utilize the institution or so how does that work? Do you negotiate with them? Um so how do you negotiate with another institution? So it if hopefully if they have a relationship it depends on the relationship between the two institutions. Um but it probably would work out. Um, I know that like at Emory where I was a grad student, Georgia Tech, had a, they had a good relationship and they could have done that. Um, but if they don't, then it might not work out. But that doesn't mean that you can't use like a core facility. Um, but that you do bring up a good point about joint appointments. If there's a department that you really want to be affiliated with, this is a good time to negotiate that. Not that you can't get it later. It's just, again, you have the power at this point to be able to do that. But yeah, you should make sure that you're going to be able to access those resources. Otherwise, it's not a good idea for you to go there. All right. Thanks, guys. Good luck on the job search.